welcome to this episode which is all about how we're managing our four acres of land which is 1.6 hectares and apologies to those who are looking forward to the episode about the solar system what happened there pete you were so excited that actually you said no let's keep it for a little bit longer <laughs> <laughs> it will be in the future, but sorry about that to anyone who is waiting for it. So generally what we've observed in Puglia and ever since I bought the property 18 years ago is that the Italians seem to, um, they turn their land. So uh, twice a year they'll go through it with a cutter first and then they come on a track with a tractor and just rake all the weeds off um, and they do that twice a year. So this is an example, even though it's a young olive orchard, it's an example of what they do here generally. Um, and that's been going on for years. Now what we've spotted is that obviously the soil quality is poor. There's been erosion over the years. The level of the land has dropped down considerably compared to the trees which you know look as if they're raised above it and also against the level of the road so over the years it's probably just scraped a layer of soil off every time they've done it and yet the compression of the tractors has pushed it down even more and very little can live in this uh, and that's what we've generally observed in Puglia. So when we came here in September 2022, two years, nearly two years ago now, we instinctively wanted to do things differently to improve the quality of the soil and the land generally um, and attract more wildlife into our four acre patch. Um, we also knew by doing that we'd be creating an awful lot more work for ourselves because in a funny kind of way it's easier what they were doing coming around twice a year with a tractor we then had to think through how we were going to do it and manage that. Our ultimate goal with all of this is to establish a balance with nature. Now we're all about Exiella and the perfect storm. At the moment there's been about 11 million trees in the Puglia region that have died and it's sweeping its way up from south going northwards and we're in the affected zone. I'm stood on our northern boundary wall here and behind us is our neighbour's trees with Chilina Donado and you can see it, it's basically dead. You've got the death grey look and what we're trying to do is to stop that because Exiella is probably only just part of the problem. Exiella may be the catalyst to all the trees dying but as some of the locals have also said it's been poor soil management, poor soil, other diseases like we found olive knot and the olive knot is transmitted by the ants in the trees that had to live there because they couldn't live in the ground. So all of these things combined with Exiella, I think, or we think, is probably the biggest factor on the trees dying. And now we're also faced by a water shortage. We're, it's much, much drier last year and there's been practically no rain over the winter. So now, not only have they got Exiella, they've got olive knot, they've got poor soil, they're not looked after, now they've got a water shortage, and the poor old trees, they just can't cope. So we're, we are surrounded on our neighbours by dead trees on the north, the south, the east and the west, and in the middle of it, as we'll show you later, our trees are actually still alive. So we're hoping to have actually saved our trees by looking after them. Over there is the tree that we've just been talking about. And I'm over here to show you what, what we're actually doing now on our land. So for a start, we're only rotivating under the 45 large Chilina Dinardo olive trees and also the smaller fruit trees, but this Rotivation allows us to turn in the organic matter that's already there. It allows us to fertilise with a mixture of different fertilisers that we're trying out. So I've got a Bokashi compost system going on and the Bokashi juice that comes from that gets put under the olive trees. We're also trying out green manure and we we'll buy some compost, uh, some uh, fertiliser as well to put under these. It, by doing this, this provides a natural protective barrier against um, certainly the spittle bug, which is responsible for spreading the xylella fastidiosa disease that's killed the 11 million trees so far in Puglia. Um, so hopefully this provides a, 
a way for them to not get to the tree uh, and possibly other insects as well. By not rotivating on the rest of the land and only rotating, uh, rotivating under the trees, it enables the wildlife out here to settle permanently and make it a natural habitat undisturbed by us. We can't uh, put individual rotivated circles under the small olive trees. We've created two blocks of land which gets turned as a whole. And um, you'll see that the quality of the soil here is actually worst. As we come to the end of our land, it's where the level between the bedrock and the top of the soil is also the lowest. So it needs to be built up and strengthened. So we've created two large compost areas where we bring all the weeds and anything else that we're pulling off from other areas. And we put it here so it can mulch down and eventually it will, it will get into the soil and peat will rotivate it into the soil to improve the soil quality. While the land was being turned, this wasn't something we had to think about because obviously it provided a complete fire break, but in Puglia definitely you're, you're obliged by law, we think, to have a, at least a one metre turned stretch of land between yourself and your neighbour because in the summer there are spontaneous fires that, that do take place and if they spread into the next door neighbour's land, you're liable for the damage. So. Um, we have created, now that we're not turning the rest of the land, we've created a fire break which Pete stays on top of with the, the strimmer and the rotivator. Again, it's more work for us, but it's definitely worth it. In the region here, what generally happens between sort of March and April, depending on the actual temperature, is they prune the olive trees once and once only. What we've been doing is that Whenever I, whenever I see a diseased branch or a limb or anything like that, no matter what time of the year it is, I'll remove that. This tree I haven't quite got round to yet, and it's got small, very small infected parts, which I will surgically remove with some special loppers that I've bought to keep on top of it. So it's a bit like having gangrene in a body. If it's bad, cut it out. I don't care what time it is, we'll just cut it out and it appears to be working they seem to be responding. Something else we've done is we've created some allocated areas for planting of crops and this is one of them. It's probably between two and three hundred square meters of land and we've got beans down here at the moment with plans to plant a lot more when we can be here permanently. This is the other allocated area for planting that we've created um, and it's about 40 square metres. We've got beans, red onions and garlic in here at the moment and the plan longer term is to set up a micro-irrigation system from the three IBCs, both all of the thousand litres each of rainwater that's collected in there so that we can keep the crops here well nourished with the water that's needed. We've been sympathetically pruning the 12 almond trees that we have always had here, the three persimmon trees and the three fig trees and the seven or so trees in the citrus grove for the last two years. Something else we've done which we don't think has ever been done here is um, we've set up tap traps which are designed to collect the olive fly that, uh, but they're also good for fruit trees as well. And th this is one I prepared earlier, like a year ago, <laughs> and it got forgotten about, so it's still here. But the idea is it's basically half the bottle and uh, because of the fish mixture that's in it, which is disgusting, uh, it attracts flies into it and they collect and collect and collect. And they're up between May and October each year. And they, we've noticed that how many flies they collect in there. 18 months ago, we got Alessandro with his digger in to dig through the bedrock in 45 spots around the land so that we could plant young fruit and nut trees. And I'm standing in our pistachio orchard, which is six trees altogether, four females and two males, so they can produce their nuts. So what we're doing is we're shredding. Everything that we get off the trees or the land that we can shred, we will shred. At the moment, I'm in the midst of pruning the smaller groves for basically fruit production. 
And these are some of the piles that I've got off it. One to my left and the one to my right are suitable for shredding because they're green, good branches for shredding. The pile over there is what I can't use because it's dry, it won't go through the shredder. So we're going to shred all this and we're going to put it back around the fruit trees first. And when we've done all the fruit trees, we're going to then start putting it back onto the small orchards because that's got the worst soil. The Italians, or the, not the Italians, everyone, because there are foreigners down here as well, like us, what they generally tend to do is just burn it all. So nothing goes back into the land and they have huge fires. We're not doing that. Again, it's a huge amount of work for us, but it's actually paying dividends around our fruit trees. In the non-rotivated areas of the land, of which obviously it's most of the land, um, peat strims twice a year. It takes him four days each time he strims, so it's no mean feat. But the piles of um, strimmings that are shredded as he goes, he lets them mulch down in situ so that they actually help with the soil quality of those areas as well, eventually. We're working to attract pollinators. So uh, part of that is a lavender growing area. There's only 14 at the moment in here, but eventually we want to plant 60 to attract the bees and um, also maybe in the long run to be able to get some essential oil, essential lavender oil from the crop. <laughs> Can I do that again? <laughs> Take three. Take three. As part of our quest to attract pollinators, we've also purchased about 550 drought tolerant plants altogether, of which half are in the inner garden. And the inner garden is located roughly in the center of the land. All of these plants are designed to attract pollinators, but also to not require water after year one, which is really important here because not only is the rain during the winter much lower than it used to be, but also we don't want to be using rainwater to water plants around the land. So this is a dry garden. It's looking fantastic at the moment. It's April and uh, we've noticed that it's a hive of activity for pollinators. The 100 metre stretch of land at the front of our property is we call zone one. And in here we've got about 40 different shrubs and lots of different um, flowers and plants, all designed to attract pollinators as well as being drought tolerant. So lastly in the quest to attract pollinators is the area around the parking. So we've got this relatively new one that you're looking at at the moment, which, is, uh, which all went in the ground in November just six months ago. and then. Over here, we've got the plants which are now in their second spring. And you can see they're all drought tolerant and they've really, really grown. So the last of the things we're doing at the moment to try and manage the land is to do something for the frogs. And we've found frogs in our pool two years in a row now, once before it was finished and now also once it's finished because it's no, it had no chemicals in it over the winter. They rather like to mate there. So we've designed and created a rusty swimming pool that should be okay for them to mate in. The funny thing is, not one rusty has been in here yet, but we've seen lizards and birds feeding from it instead. <laughs> so a, a little habitat for nature, whether or not the frogs choose to use it, I guess. So those are all the things that we've been doing for between 18 months and two years now and we've seen a real difference and we want to run you through what those differences are now. Um, I've been cutting the trees now for all, well just over two years and one of the first things I noticed when I started cutting the big trees, these particularly big trees behind us, the Chilina Donado, which were about 12 to 14 metres high, was that they were infested with ants, well, infested. They, the ants were just all over the trees, top to bottom. Um, and now, since we've stopped rotivating the land, the ants have moved from the trees into the ground. And I don't know if you can see, but just in front of me, I've got one, two, three, four, five, five ant nests. And when I'm cutting the trees now, the ants aren't there. One of the problems, one of the problems that we faced when we were actually 
with the trees is I discovered olive knot, which is an external bacteria, which is like a knobble on the top of a branch. And what was happening is the ants were living in the trees and these knots were perfect homes for them. So they're burrowing into these bacterial knots and then they were moving around the tree. So the ants were spreading the bacteria around the tree because they were living up there and the trees were infected with olive knot. So now that I've cut out all the olive knot, we've taken the trees down in height. We're not rotivating the land. So right now when I go around the trees, I haven't seen any more olive knot and all the ants are quite happily living where they should be in the ground. We've noticed more wildlife generally and uh, that includes last October when Pete was rotivating around one of the small fruit trees. He spotted movement and it turned out it was the most incredible tarantula wolf spider, wolf spider with hundreds of babies on her back and we'd obviously inadvertently disturbed her nest because it's usually a nocturnal spider but this was in the daytime when he was rotivating and she couldn't have lived on this land before we came here and changed how we how we rotivate so that and apparently wolf spiders provide tits with 80 percent the small birds with 80 percent of their food intakes so they're really important to have hopefully those hundreds of babies are now scattered all over our land making their own nests We've also noticed that the lizards, little rock lizard type things, are no longer confined to having to nest in the roots and the stumps of the big olive trees, which is where they were before. And they're now scurrying around everywhere when we walk around. We've also noticed that there's more birds on the land from small birds like the serin, which have a wonderful um, tune that goes really like it's a bird on speed, like a robin on speed. And then hoopoos, which look magnificent. They're flying around here a lot more and also birds of prey. La Bola is now a bee and pollinator super highway. And when I, when I say that, I mean the noise, uh, sometimes when you're weeding near a bush in particular that attracts them is just out of this world to hear. So they, they're coming to and from this inner garden an awful lot now, whereas they never used to come at all. There was nothing to come for. And outside of the inner garden, we've got our other fruit trees, which inevitably ben benefit from the roots to and from. So we're getting better crops now than we've ever seen here. This is a type of mandarin tree and that's blossoming and will be covered in pollinators very soon. We've got a Four Seasons lemon tree which just doesn't stop producing lemons and the size of some of these lemons after fertiliser and proper pruning um, has really taken us aback. Then we've got another type of mandarin, which we've just finished uh, cropping and it needs to be thinned out, but we've had a litre, pretty much a litre of juice from this tree for the last three weeks, uh, just from this one tree crop. Um, then we've got oranges, another lemon and two more oranges at the back. And the oranges are perfect for the best marmalade and the most delicious fruit juice. Okay, one of the other things that we've really noticed um, is the production of our, our almond trees. We've sympathetically pruned the almond trees, we've rotivated around the soil, and right now our almond trees are absolutely brimming. They're, they're all over the place. Um, so, and you know, last year and the year before, they had some, but nowhere near as many as they've got now. So I think it's just a case of a bit of TLC, proper pruning and giving them just enough to produce with, with a limited amount of water that they're now getting. We've just walked just slightly outside where it's maybe five or six metres from our land and Giuseppe owns this land and he's about 80 odd and he stopped the other day and was chatting to us about our almonds and his almonds. And he basically said that they've owned the land for 100, 120 years, and every year they've had loads of almonds. This year, they've got none, none whatsoever. The trees are nice and green. You can see that they haven't pruned them, they haven't looked after them, 
but there are no almonds on them. And he came over to ours and went, wow, you've got loads of almonds on your trees. I've got none. So it's, it's unheard of. A hundred odd years, unheard of. So again, I think, especially in this region, people are going to have to work harder and look after their trees and their crops to produce because it's getting harder for the trees to actually produce because of climate change and not being looked after. Um, what used to happen here before we actually took over the land was that uh, uh, Rocco, who was one of the local farmers, would come over here and turn the land for us for free in effect in return for harvesting and keeping the harvest, the oil and the olives. Part of that was the fact that he would also harvest these smaller groves which have got Pichelina, Caratina and Lecino olives which are quite considerably more valuable olives and we noticed when we came here two years ago that they'd obviously just harvested the trees the, the, the year before that and they must have done it incredibly roughly or brutally because on the trees themselves there were no leaves so when they harvested them I don't know how they've done it or how they did it but the poor old trees had no leaves on there and we were told by Rocco oh, these trees only produce every two years well, last year we harvested and we did it incredibly sympathetically, hand harvested into nets. 135 litres. 135 litres, as Sally points out. But we did it sympathetically into nets. We were very careful with the, how we harvested them, not to damage the trees. And they've all got leaves on them and they've all got buds on them again this year. So it looks like by looking after them, not harvesting them in a fashion which takes all their leaves off, is that we're going to get a harvest every year out of these poor trees because they're budding like mad and again one of the locals came over and he went you've got buds on your trees i went yeah so again a little bit of tlc and we're probably going to benefit from it the trees are certainly benefiting from it because they look a lot better and a lot happier the last of our observations is that we've noticed how well our large, 45 large Chilina Dinardo olive trees have fared compared to the neighbourhoods generally around here where they look pretty sad. We've got buds on a lot of these trees that we never expected to have. Two years ago we were told that all the Chilina Dinardos uh, around here would be dead within two years. These are still very much alive. And we, we don't know for sure and only time will tell, but could the measures that we've been taking be responsible for the fact that these trees are still alive? How much work have I put in, Sam? Yeah, small amount of about 60 hours per tree Pete has spent to trim and cut out any visible signs of disease since we got here. Um, which we don't see anybody else investing that kind of time. Probably because they can't, but you know, we're lucky, we're able to do that and we have done that and it, we're hoping that that will go an awful long way to their survival. Thank you for watching. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and we also hope that you will subscribe if you're interested in what we're doing at La Bola. Do make comments. We love, we love it when we get comments and I'll reply to those personally. And also um, do give us a like if you've enjoyed it. Thank you. And for those who saw the, or got it to the end of the last one that said I was going to do the next episode on an electrical solar setup and us going off grid, Sally was really excited for that, but actually <laughs> we fitted in this one first. <laughs> and the one after this one will be the design of our solar off-grid system and then the one after that will be me installing it so if Can't you want wait. that can't wait go for it <laughs>